Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good afternoon, Team Krulak community. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brew Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brewcast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the U.S. government. With that, I'm going to turn things over now to Dr. Amin Tarzi, Director of Middle East Studies here at the Krulak Center and Marine Corps University. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. If you're from outside the United States, good whatever time of day you are in. Uh, my name is Amin Tarzi. I, I direct the Middle East Studies. Uh, and it is a privilege first to uh, welcome Ms. Uh, Yan San, and I thank her for accepting our invitation. And secondly, to say a few words about what this process is. We have, the Middle East Studies has been in the Marine Corps University since 2007. Uh, and we usually hold uh, annual lecture series, depending on the topic that is pertinent to our student body and the professional military education uh, continuum uh, as a whole within the United States, but mainly at the NCR, the National Capital Region. Uh, and we change that depending, as I said, on, on what, what our students and, and our researchers want. This, what you have right now, this is the inaugural session of something new that we are launching uh, with, uh, in cooperation with the Brut uh, Krulak Center, which we are now part of, MES is part of in the past two years. Uh, and we call this one a, uh, a research talk. So it's a Middle East studies research talk in conjunction with the broadcast, which is part of a series that has been uh, ongoing for the last two years within uh, the Krulak Center. So the idea here is whether virtually, as we're doing it right now, or uh, physically when possible, to bring up topics that are up to, 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 to in, in the interest of our, our students, not what we have already stated in a year uh, in advance, for example, our lecture series this year, it's this academic year, is dealing with the Eastern Mediterranean. And we keep on going through that almost every month. But this topic, of obviously, is not Eastern Mediterranean. These are topics of the date. And then we look at people who are uh, experts in this. We certainly have an expert uh, with us right now. And then we open up this to uh, the audience within the Marine Corps University, as well as uh, to a wider audience anywhere. Uh, you just uh, come in as you have, some of you have done, and we are glad to see all of you there. Uh, with that, it is a, a, indeed a pleasure for me uh, to, to introduce uh, Ms. Yan Sun, who is the director for the China program and co-director for the East Asia program at, and a senior fellow at the Stimson Center here in Washington, DC. Her expertise is on Chinese foreign policy, U.S.-China relations and China's relations with neighboring countries and authoritarian regimes. If I dare say, Afghanistan now fits both of those. It's a neighbor of China. It's an authoritarian regime, I would say. Uh, previously, from 2001 to 2014, she was a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution with a joint appointment with the Foreign Policy Program and the Global Development Program, where she focused on Chinese national security, decision-making process, and China-Africa relations. From 2008 to 2011, she was a China analyst based in Beijing for the International Crisis Group, specializing on China's foreign policy towards conflict countries and the developing world. She holds a master's degree in international policy and practice from the George Washington University, again in Washington, and an MA in Asia Pacific Studies and a BA in international relations from Foreign Affairs College in Beijing. Again, thank you for being our uh, guest. The floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown, and thank you, uh, Kareem, for the kind of introduction and also for the invitation to speak to your distinguished group of uh, of, of audience. So uh, my name is Yun Sun. I primarily focus on Chinese foreign policy and the China's relationship with neighboring countries and also our term regimes. Um, so it's my great honor to be invited to talk to you about China's, uh, basically China's policy planning and strategic vision for Afghanistan upon the U.S. withdrawal. 
um, I'll divide my talk into uh, three portions. The first one is how China assess the domestic politics in Afghanistan after the, the fall of Kabul and where does China stand on that. Um, the second, I think, will be uh, interesting for this group is uh, China's security preparation, basically how China prepares through unilateral and multilateral approach for a potential fallout or crisis in Afghanistan. And the third portion, I will focus on the economic outlook, given the invitation from Taliban to uh, for China to step into Afghanistan and especially invest in the uh, in the in the mining sector. So I want to unpack a little bit how China sees the economic opportunities in Afghanistan and whether it is uh, it has any possibility of transferring uh, anytime soon. If we have time, I'd be happy to also to cover the interaction with the, that dynamics between U.S. and China coming to uh, Afghanistan, because uh, in fact, one of the main concerns or one of the main uh, main factors in China's decision about going into Afghanistan is uh, how it will be viewed by the United States and whether the U.S. will see this as a problematic relationship like the one that China has with Iran and in the future date will come back and and pick this up and the decision China makes today will potentially by China uh, in the future. So that's the layout of my talk. Um, first, how China sees the Taliban-led regime that's, uh, that has been uh, in place since since September. So when the Taliban-led government was first announced on um, uh, September 8th, China was not happy. China was dissatisfied with the composition of the, of the government because uh, just like the United States and the rest of the uh, the international community, the inclusiveness of that government was not sufficient. But for Beijing, the um, lack of inclusiveness or the composition itself does fully reflect the religious and ethnic composition of, uh, of Afghan Taliban. So in the additional uh, members of the cabinet and the deputies announced on September 21st, the list had included multiple uh, ethnic minorities. So although there's no women in the uh, on the list, which still makes us uh, a large deficiency for the international community, but for China, the inclusion of the ethnic minority members in the Taliban-led regime basically sufficed the Chinese demand and the Chinese criteria for inclusiveness of the Taliban-led government. So since the very beginning, China has been offering this Taliban-led government uh, a tremendous amount of benefit of the doubt. The Chinese believe that Taliban has become more practical and more moderate. And in the Chinese vision for Afghan Taliban, they, uh, the expectation is very similar to China's expectation of Pakistan, which is, uh, which is to turn Pakistan into a 3M country. 3M stands for Muslim, moderate, and modern. So there is a genuine hope in Beijing that the Taliban could leave the country out of the dec decades-long quagmire, assuming that Taliban will become moderate and more importantly, pragmatic. On the issue of the legitimacy of the Afghan Taliban, um, I don't think that is an issue for Beijing because uh, Chinese Communist Party certainly did not win its legitimacy through democratic elections. So for China, what you will see is that China keeps emphasizing that, um, that the future of Afghan, Afghanistan is people's choice. And since Taliban has taken over and the people has not launched a major pushback against it, the Chinese will see that as an as a indicator that probably at this historical moment, uh, Taliban is Afghan people's choice. Um, I think the surrender of the, um, by the warlords before Taliban took over the, the whole country in August, also attest to this conviction in China that, well, Afghan Taliban does have certain legitimacy uh, this time around. But coming to diplomatic recognitions, um, the Chinese are still hold, holding or withholding diplomatic recognition as a leverage against the, uh, the Taliban -like regime. Um, it is safe to say that China will not be the first one to recognize the Taliban led government but China is not going to be the last either. So despite this positive tone and hope for long-term change of the Afghan Taliban, 
uncertainty remains to be the key word in China's assessment of Afghanistan, and it is going to remain so for the foreseeable future. The Chinese identify a long list of uh, of challenges faced by the Afghan Taliban, including Taliban's lack of capacity to run the government, a multi-layered crisis from food shortage to social instability, the consolidated what the Chinese see as symbiosis between the Taliban and terrorist organizations in Afghanistan after decades of interdependence, especially on a local level. There's also the difficulties to win internal international recognition for the Taliban, and also the reputational baggage that Taliban has to carry for the Haqqani network, as well as the uh, last but not least, the potential for escalated great power competition in Afghanistan, primarily between US and China, and the potential for a proxy proxy war as uh, as defined by the Chinese. So although China is concerned with the overall stability and security of Afghanistan, um, the one issue that tops all other concerns for China is Taliban's relationship with the weaker militant groups in Afghanistan. So on September 9th, Taliban spokesperson told the Chinese media in an exclusive interview that um, many East Turkestan Islamic movement EPIM members have left Afghanistan because the Taliban has categorically told them that there's no place for anyone to use Afghanistan against other countries, including its neighboring countries. So this commitment has temporarily, or this, this narrative has temporarily sufficed China's demand for a severance of ties. Although I would say that in China, there's very little confidence that the different factions of the Taliban and the Taliban personnel on the local level will strictly follow this guideline from the political uh, leadership on the top. So therefore, uh, China has been actively weaving a safety net to prevent the potential spillover effect of what the Chinese call the three evil forces, um, separatism, terrorism, and extremism from Taliban, uh, from Afghanistan, especially in the event of, uh, of the Taliban not able to unite the country and the country falls into a civil war again. So what are some of the security preparations um, that China has uh, has uh, has done in, in preparation for this uh, this weaker militant spillover issue? The first method that China has adopted is uh, is direct demand for Taliban to uh, to rein in the ETIM and rein in the weaker cells and to draw a political red line uh, to the Afghan Taliban very clearly in bilateral and in multilateral settings. So this demand has been very clearly posed to the Taliban during the senior level meetings, for example, in, uh, in by the end of July, when Bayardel uh, visited China, the Chinese foreign minister directly told him that Taliban will have to, to sever all its relationship with, with the weaker militant groups. And the, as, as a reaction, the Taliban also confirmed to China that Afghanistan Taliban will not allow any forces to use Afghan territory to do things that will harm China. So politically, at least the message is, uh, is conveyed and the signal is, uh, is signaling has been uh, received without any, uh, without any question. However, about this commitment that Taliban has given China, the Chinese don't have a lot of confidence about what Taliban leadership might be saying because uh, the different factions and the locals may not follow the decisions made by the, by the leadership on the top. And the Chinese also understand that, that ideologically, in terms of personnel, in terms of financial network and, um, and the arms supply, Taliban has many relationships close association with uh, many terrorist groups and terrorist personnel in the in the region. So therefore, I think the Chinese have a very sober understanding that the support from Taliban towards ETIM and other weaker cells in Afghanistan is not only present, but it is also going to going to continue despite the political commitment on the top to eradicate those support. So the question then for China is that how does China prepare for this continued presence of uh, ETIM and Uyghur militant groups in Afghanistan for the foreseeable future. There is, a, a, 
I, I count at least five to six um, different approaches that China has been preparing for it. The first layer is uh, is a, is a border protection or the border patrol. Um, Afghanistan only shares a very short border with China, no more than uh, 60, 60 miles between the two countries. And it basically the border is a Wakhan corridor, the Wakhan Pass. And in China, it is called a, the Wakhan Pass is called impenetrable counterterrorism iron war. Well, there's a specific reason for it. The Wakhan Pass is at a very high altitude and is also a mountainous region with almost no population. So what that means is anyone who tries to cross the border from the Wakhan Pass, from the Wakhan Corridor, is very easily identifiable from the, uh, from the Chinese border patrol's point of view. So the, uh, the Chinese official media has uh, commented that since 1980, there was only one family that was able to uh, cross over from Afghanistan to China. Um, three people, parents and, and, the, and, and, and the baby boy, and this happened in 1984. So basically for the Chinese to, for the Uyghur militants to carry arms and cross the border from Afghanistan into China directly through the Balkan Pass is, uh, is highly unlikely. However, the Chinese has been strengthening or um, strengthening and enhancing its border patrol along the, along the shared border nevertheless. So um, the, the border was closed since the uh, October of 2000, of the 2001. Um, so, and for, for the Chinese, the, the possibility is pretty low. Um, but the question is, other than the Wakhan Pass, is there other paths or other possibilities of this infiltration or penetration through the Chinese border? And the most likely area identified is the eastern uh, region of Tajikistan, because this is a region that has very little security forces stationed in the area. And historically, the Uyghur militant groups, as identified by the Chinese, have used the Tajik border with China much more significantly than the Afghan shared border with China in order to, to, to cross into, into China. So Tajikistan really has been presented as a prime example or the prime case where the Chinese counterterrorism force or the counterterrorism preparation needs to prioritize. And uh, the Chinese has been pr prioritizing this, this area or this region for about seven years now. Basically, since the uh, beginning of the NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2014, China has been ramping up the capacity and the support to uh, Tajikistan in order to collectively deal with this counterterrorism challenge. So the, the type of support has included um, equipments, security facilities, such as the um, watchtowers uh, along the Tajik-Afghan border, uh, the reports, certain um, well, the reports has uh, quoted about 40 such watchtowers provided by China to be, uh, well, that have been deployed along the Tajik Afghan border. Uh, the Chinese also provided the assistance to build training centers and counter drug, um, well, counter drug trafficking, counter narcotics facilities along the Tajik Afghan border. In terms of the equipments, China has provided Tajikistan with uh, mine resistant ambush protected vehicles as well as uh, armored vehicles in order to ramp up its capacity. Um, China has been jointly hosting um, joint military exercises with both Tajikistan and, and Afghanistan. And the, the frequency of the military exercise between China and Tajikistan has been increasing visibly since 2000, uh, 2015. So uh, hundreds of Chinese soldiers have participated in this type of uh, military exercise along the Afghanistan, Afghan Tajik border instead of the Afghan China or the uh, Tajikistan China border. Um, similar military, similar exercises have included humanitarian assistance uh, exercise under the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, um, cybersecurity exor joint exercise, and also periodic counterterrorism exercise uh, within the framework of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, in 2018, it was reported that the Chinese PRA and armed police have established a joint counterterrorism center in Badashan um, region in, in Tajikistan. 
So there have been reports about the Chinese armed police being present at um, at this location. The Chinese never officially acknowledged that, that there, uh, this, this is indeed happening. But in private conversations, the Chinese are not denying it either. But for Chinese, the, frame, uh, the way that they have framed this counterterrorism center is that China, where the Chinese armed police have been at this location to provide the training uh, to, the, to the local security personnel. So it's not the Chinese security personnel directly being deployed at this center. They are there, but they're not there as, uh, as a part of a deployment, but instead they're serving a training purpose. Um, China has been building multilateral or minilateral uh, mechanisms with countries in the region <coughs> to talk about joint the security cooperation upon the um, to prepare for the potential spillover in Afghanistan. And this includes, for example, the quadrilateral mechanism among Afghanistan, China, Pakistan, and, and Tajikistan that was established in 2016. And between China, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, there's also the trilateral ministerial level um, mechanism of consultation. So for China, uh, there are Chinese government experts who are openly committing that China has established basically a joint counterterrorism force with um, Tajikistan and Pakistan whether well, whether Taliban-led regime will be participating in this is remains to be seen. But at least the previous Ghani government was a part of this uh, joint counterterrorism force deployed in in Tajikistan. And if the situation deteriorates in Afghanistan and there is a major spillover through the eastern region of, of Tajikistan, um, the Chinese expressed the uh, commitment and they actually said uh, an agreement has already been made. Uh, um, privately between China, Tajikistan, and Russia to establish a buffer zone in Tajikistan, on, on the Tajik side of the border, uh, that will act as a buffer between Afghanistan and, and Tajikistan. So whether that's going to happen, we will see. Um, China and Russia has, has launched several different aspects of their cooperation in preparation for, uh, for the security fallout in Afghanistan. Um, in this past August, China and Russia jointly staged a military exercise in Ningxia province in China. Uh, Ningxia is a Midwestern province in China with uh, terrains and weathers and the uh, geography climate very similar to that of Afghanistan. So the fact that, that they picked this, uh, this location for the military exercise signifies that they are targeting Afghanistan and potential chaos in Afghanistan for this uh, military exercise. So um, there's an interesting debate currently ongoing in China as for to what extent Russia is willing to let SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, to take the lead as a regional platform in the event of a security crisis from Afghanistan. Because uh, what people have observed in China is that Russia seems to have a higher level of interest in using CSO, not SCO. CSO is a collective security organization for um, for 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 the regional collaboration coming to the security uh, issues in Afghanistan. So without the uh, major deterioration or the spillover effect being uh, transparent on the ground, I think we probably would not uh, have a clear answer as for whether uh, which platform will be will be uh, relied on primarily. But I think there's a very clear vision between both China and Russia that eventually Afghanistan will be incorporated into the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as a full member once the country, uh, the internal situation stabilizes. So if these are the security preparations, what are some of the uh, economic corporations? Is uh, well, we have seen enough media reports about Afghanistan being this, uh, uh, being this, uh, this um paradise of uh, of mining projects that is whether it's lithium or copper um it might be true but historically the economic value of afghanistan for china has never been about the natural resources endowment of afghanistan itself those matter but not significantly enough historically afghanistan is a uh, intrinsic indispensable component of China's Silk Road, even 
date back to Han Dynasty 2000 years ago. So for Afghanistan, uh, for China, Afghanistan has always been a part of a geoeconomic corridor, a trading route that historically anchored China's trade with Middle East and with, uh, with Europe. So in comparison, um, the economic resources of Afghanistan itself is important, but is uh, hardly the priority. So we have seen that Taliban openly welcome Chinese investment in the reconstruction of Afghanistan. And Taliban also promised that they will guarantee the safety of uh, Chinese investors and workers. So this is also, I think, touches upon a, a sensitive spot of, of us, of the United States, which is that if China indeed launches into Afghanistan economically after our withdrawal, then it will be a pretty clear sign that China is filling um, the void left by us, and it's also capitalizing on the U.S. withdrawal from the from the country. However, judging by um, the reality on the ground, I don't think this massive economic economic investment is going to happen in the immediate future. Um, and the major investment, especially into the mining sector, is uh, is very unlikely. Um, because there consistently has been a disconnect between the Chinese rhetoric about Afghanistan's economic value and the lack of actual projects from China in the country. So we have seen the Chinese officials portraying Afghanistan as a, as a key link in the Belt, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, as well as in China, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, regional economic integration. But this rosy picture is not supported by the actual data at all. So, in fact, starting from 2015, uh, is a very low level and almost stagnant, um, stagnant level of uh, foreign direct investment into Afghanistan. For the first six months of this year, the total Chinese FDI in the country was $2 million. And the the value of the new service contract signed was uh, one hundred and thirty thousand dollars between China and Afghanistan, which means that the number of Chinese companies and workers working on projects in Afghanistan as as contractors is also extremely small. So for the whole year last year, the total FDI into Afghanistan was four million dollar uh, four million dollars, but that's less than. 3% of the Chinese FDI to, uh, to, to neighboring Pakistan. And when we talk about Chinese economic investment in Afghanistan throughout the history, well, if you just look at everything, there are only two noticeable projects. Uh, one is the Anna Copper Mine, and the other one is the uh, Amur Dayar um, Basin Oil Project. And both projects were signed um, in the past, well, the, the Copper Mine was signed somewhere around 2007, 2008, and the uh, the oil project was signed in 2011. Both projects have been ill fated due to a number of uh, a number of reasons: archaeological ex ex excavation, security threats, renegotiation of terms, as well as uh, the resettling of the locals. So, among these, the political instability and security threats are the top concerns. So, as long as the security environment in the country remains unstable. It is improbable for China to launch major economic investment into uh, into Afghanistan. So, in this sense, U.S. troops presence was not only a preferred by uh, by China; it was also deemed as in indispensable. So, therefore, with the U.S. troops withdrawal, it is unlikely that the Chinese will invest or launch into Afghanistan without sustainable peace and stability that China can see. And without the Taliban severing its relationship with the weaker militant groups in the in the near future, um, like I mentioned, Afghanistan's more important aspect for China is uh, is its location, is its location as a part of the Belt and Road Initiative and in China's e geoeconomic expansion. So on that, I think the more desired picture that Chinese are seeing is to work with Pakistan. And and with the Taliban-led regime to incorporate Afghanistan into the China-Pakistan economic corridor, and turn Afghanistan into another wing of the economic corridor, pr primarily for hardware connect connectivity projects. Um, 
so what we're seeing is that the Chinese vision for this, just like the Chinese vision for the uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, has a strong element of social engineering. And the logic is that if China could introduce economic opportunities into the fragile and authoritarian stage, and use these opportunity, economic opportunities, whether it's through the uh, infrastructure projects or through the um, job creation on the industry level, then it will have a st stabilization effect for the country's politics and security situation. Whether this uh, social engineering is a successful endeavor, I think that's subject to debate. And the jury is still out on this one because uh, when China looks at its own development in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, better economic development actually has not led into a uh, led to stability. In fact, with the growth of people's wealth in the in the Uyghur region, it can be argued that the um, the propensity for the Uyghurs to pursue their own uh, ethnic identity and to pursue their own ethnic uh, privilege is uh, has been growing, and some of the most ardent supporters uh, among the Uyghur population has been those ones that are economically successful. So the Uyghur businessmen who are successful um, in 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 under the Chinese government policy have been uh, more uh, more ardent to the supporters of the Uyghur independence movements as well. Um, and same thing, same questions could be raised about the uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, because uh, although the CPAC has thrown into billions of dollars into, into Pakistan, it has not really elevated the country's fragile security situation domestically. And if you look at the examples this year, between April and July, there were four terrorist attacks against the Chinese nationals and Chinese assets on the ground in uh, in Pakistan, including one attack at a, at a hotel in, in Quetta uh, that was targeting, <clears throat> targeting where the Chinese ambassador was staying at that moment. So it's subject to debate whether this economic development leading to stability equation is really going to, is really going to work out. But at least so far, um, the Chinese and the Pakistanis do share a certain level of vision coming to Afghanistan that will in utilize infrastructure projects, utilize the trade connectivity to incorporate Afghanistan into uh, China and Pakistan's regional vision. Great, thank you very much, um, Ms. Sun, and to Dr. Tarzi and Dr. Anzalone as well for getting this whole thing set up today. In terms of, uh, so again, thanks to everyone for taking the time out today. We're uh, working right now on the schedule for sort of the, the late fall, early winter slate of Brewcast talks. So make sure you're uh, following us on our social media channels or on our get on our email distribution list to see what the next uh, several episodes are. I know a couple we're working on is looking at Wake Island as a case study for defense of a island position uh, and uh, also looking at arranging some authors from the Commandant's reading list here in the near future. Uh, but we are chewing on all of that. So again, Thank you. Have a great afternoon, and we will see you on the next episode. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.